Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad that you are here and that you're maintaining an open mind over the fact that we have to overcome the significant adjustments and challenges that we have during this COVID-19 pandemic. And so during our time together with this video, we're going to learn and reflect about pedagogy in an online environment and how that is different than what we experience as face-to-face -face teachers. And so I encourage you to think different, uh, differently about teaching in an online environment and utilize this time to really reflect on how are you going to approach working with your children in an online environment and how does that differ from what your experience is in a face-to-face -face environment? Many of the resources that I'm going to utilize and reflect come from this playbook, which is the Distance Learning Playbook. Um, it's by authors Fisher, Fry, and Hattie, some of my favorite uh, researchers and authors. It just came out here um, a couple weeks ago, and it's an excellent resource, and we're going to utilize many of the resources here. Um, you'll notice as we go through this video, there'll be times when I encourage you to stop the video and reflect on your practice. Uh, I'll ask you to click on hyperlinks to reflect on your practice, but I wanted to make it one continuous video that you can go back and utilize. So let's jump in. Let's begin reflecting on our pedagogy uh, as teachers and how we're going to tackle this great new school year um, with the approach of knowing our face-to-face -face strategies as well as utilizing new online learning and online pedagogy strategies as well. Thanks so much for joining me. We know that our behavior is shaped by the group that we're in. And depending on the gathering that we're in, that's going to shape how we act in the environment. So just like you set classroom expectations and classroom norms in a face-to-face -face environment, the first thing you want to start off with is creating norms for your online learning environment. And so for this example, you'll see that uh, Hattie, Fisher, and Fry provide you some sample peer-to-peer -peer learning norms in an online environment. The norms that you create for your virtual classroom space then become the foundation for the agreements that you want to use with children. These agreements are essential because they are the components for managing a very smooth running online learning environment. And once we have the well-crafted agreements in conjunction with the students, as we'll talk about, those, become, those are now your teacher expectations for the class and that ensures that you have an ongoing um, positive student experience when it comes to being in the online learning environment. And so we wanna look at what are the key components of the agreements. And notice that I'm using the word agreement uh, or expectations as opposed to using the word rules. We wanna ensure that we maintain a positive outlook on what we expect of students and what we expect of each other. And so let's talk about the key components with these agreements. The first one is, and we know this from the face-to-face -face environment, is that the fewer the better. You want to ensure that you have about three to five expectations or agreements with your students. Um, more than that, and the students tend to forget them. Secondly, you want to ensure that you co-construct them with your students. We know that if we co-construct agreements in the face-to-face -face environment, and just like in the online environment, the students will feel as though it's fair and that we've developed it with them as opposed to imposing it on them. Uh, as I talked about previously too, we want to ensure that we state it positively. We want to highlight what we expect of students and what we expect of each other in a positive manner. The more that we focus on the negative, then students and adults, honestly, tend to act in the negative. So we wanna ensure that it's positive. Um, also ensure that your agreements are specific in nature. State explicitly what behavior you want of your students in that online environment, and then the students are be be better able, excuse me, better able to uh, self-regulate. And this is especially important for our students um, with IEPs and, uh, and students that don't exactly know what's expected as far as how to behave in an online learning environment. And so we need to be very explicit with them on what our ex expectations are. 
Next, you want to obviously post your, your agreements uh, somewhere within your Google Classroom. And this is similar to posting your agreements in your actual physical face-to-face -face class. And then, and then finally, now that you have your agreements, now you can teach and rehearse the expectations. And this is similar to what you do in the face-to-face -face environment, and uh, the elementary team is very well aware of this. You spend an entire week, essentially, going over the expectations and the procedures in a face-to-face -face environment. And that shouldn't be any different in an online uh, learning environment. You want to go over what those expectations are. You want to go over practicing those expectations. And by doing that continuously and focusing on that at the very start of your work in an online learning environment, then the better off you'll be for the entire year. Since you'll be in an online learning environment and you won't have to practice procedures and routines physically like you do in a face-to-face -face environment, one of the things that you need to consider are where can students reliably access the information that they need. And so what we're going to do is do a short activity and you're going to click on this document that is a reflective document and complete the questions where to assist in planning and thinking through in a reflective manner of where your students can find, for example, weekly schedules or possibly a monthly schedule. Where can they plan to find your assignments and materials? How would they submit work? How do they find their graded information? How can they contact you if they need help? And how can they also get technical help? Please pause this video in order to complete that reflection. Even if you've had previous face-to-face -face interactions with the students, please don't neglect the, the importance of reestablishing relationships with your students in a virtual space. And so when it comes to your first distance class, the first time that you meet together, ensure that you greet students and greet students by name. So if you don't know their names or how to pronounce them, please ask the children what's the, what's the proper way to pronounce their names. Uh, and you want to ensure that you greet them by name each time whenever they're coming in. Also, personalize your space. You can change around your background or have student work up in a virtual background uh, to create a personalized virtual space. Or perhaps you create a word cloud of all the students' names um, or, uh, and, and post that in, in the background of your environment so that you have a personalized space when it comes to the learning environment. And finally, also very critically, is to, to learn your students' interests and utilize that in your virtual teaching and, and learning with the students. So how will you establish or possibly reestablish these relationships with students in a distance learning environment? We have a list here started for you and we'd like you to take a moment to reflect and personalize it in your context as an educator. Please pause this video in order to complete that reflection. Disney Parks is known for their world-class experience when you go to any Walt Disney World uh, park. And one of the areas where they focus on is the concept of touch points. And we want to utilize that aspect of touch points where you're focusing on the personal interactions to the functional items, as well as the personal relationships uh, in an environment. And so we want to utilize what Disney focuses on with touch points in our virtual learning environment and with the goal of increasing the amount of touch points that we have with all students because we no longer have that opportunity to engage with children in say the cafeteria or as we're walking down the hall or after a pep rally, we don't have that option uh, in a virtual environment. And so what we need to do is we need to increase utilizing different strategies as far as touch points with our children. And so here's some strategies that you can utilize uh, in order to increase the amount of touch points that you have in your virtual space. 
One is develop a system for calling on students and knowing who hasn't participated. Now, often our educators use this uh, in the physical space um, with say, uh, using craft sticks or name cards on a ring, using virtual number, a numbering system in order to maintain that, but ensure that you also still do this uh, and ensure that you call on or interact with each student during your face-to-face -face time that you have. Second is to ensure that every live session includes both whole group and small group discussions. Now we know that this pedagogy is very effective in a face-to-face -face environment, so it does transfer in an online learning environment. So you want to ensure that you create small lecture time, um, but then also provide opportunities for children to work in smaller groups together, even online. And if you assign discussion boards, be sure to actively participate in them. So you don't want to make discussion boards just an assignment to post and then uh, the students no longer hear from the teacher in the discussion board. You want to be an active participant as well and engage in those comments that students respond with. And then finally, we want to utilize what's known as pop-up pedagogy. And this, com this comes from Fitzpatrick. I, he did this in um, 2016, and what I like about it is it's talking about the fact that we have a limited amount of time where we get to interact with children in the virtual environment where we're actually engaging face-to-face -face synchronously. And Fitzpatrick talks about uh, pop-up pedagogy and thinking about the pop-ups that we get on a computer screen or as we're navigating a website. And Fitzpatrick said, you know, what we can do is we can engage in the number of touch points by creating strategies to engage with t children in an asynchronous manner. And so you can use apps such as Remind 101, um, post assignments, uh, post photos of students or have students post their own photos as they're working on their assignments or um, photos of themselves on engaging in experiments that they're doing on the Google Classroom. Um, you can ask your younger children to uh, post photos of themselves um, working or possibly working in their, their environment where their learning environment is, is stationed in their, in their home. Um, you can craft a newsletter, develop a newsletter, maybe it's weekly or maybe it's monthly on what children and families can expect coming, uh, coming forward. Um, you can provide uh, personalized directions. So doing a quick video uh, allows you to provide personalized instructions on how to complete an assignment as opposed to just utilizing text. Uh, and it makes a much more engaging touch point with individuals. And then finally, utilize apps for voice recordings. We know that it does take an extensive amount of time to type out feedback to students on, on their work. So utilize um, a variety of Google plugins uh, with Chrome, uh, Chrome extensions to just utilize voice to reflect on the student's, uh, student's work as opposed to just responding via text or via an email. And all of these strategies are things that you can utilize that help engage in the amount of touch points that you have with children throughout the week. One significant impact when it comes to learning in both the face-to-face -face as well as the online learning environment is the aspect of teacher clarity. And when you look at teacher clarity, it has a very large effect size of 0.75, meaning that it can have a significant accelerator to uh, students learning. And so with that being said, there are key components when we look at teacher clarity when it comes to either a face-to-face -face environment or even an online learning environment. And it comes down to three things. The children, as well as sometimes the parents and guardians when you look at on online learning environments, wanna know, what am I learning today? Why am I learning it? And then lastly, how will I know that I learned it? And those three aspects, if you can answer those questions in your online learning environment, when you start the lesson, then you are going to reach that teacher clarity that students need in order to accelerate their learning. And so we provided for you a sample. This comes from Mr. Gavin, he's a physics teacher. And what he did is he took his uh, statements and his intentions 
and turn them into I can statements. And very often we see this in the elementary environment, but it also is very successful in the secondary learning environment. And so you can see that he has his learning intentions listed there and then the sec success criteria. And so he's able to answer those three elements to children uh, as far as what are you going to learn today? Why are you going to learn it? And then how will you know that you have actually learned that material? And he can integrate that in one document. Uh, and it can also serve as a checklist um, for students to ensure that they've understood the material and the expectations of the teacher. When we review engagement and look at student engagement, we wanna go from a more passive engaging experience in the online environment to a very active one where students are investing and driving uh, the goals that they have when it comes to their learning. And so what we want to do is ensure that we think of the functions of engagement and not just the tools because the goal is not to say just use twitter or to upload a video to youtube um, the goal might be that we want students to be able to research information or the goal might be that we want the students to use a series of of tweets in order to garner a prompt response for a community project and so we encourage you to not focus on the medium or the actual tool, because as we know, there's constant new tools available um, for teaching and learning in an online environment. And they are very cool and very neat as we go through all of them. But the goal is the function. Does it reach our educational goals and what we seek to have children accomplish? And so this chart does a good job at, at showcasing the engagement opportunities as well as the sample goal, sample tools that you can use for the goals that you have. Please pause this video in order to complete that reflection. We discussed teacher clarity and organization previously in the video. Since they all connect to engagement, we want to ensure that we design tasks with engagement in mind. And the tasks that students complete, whether they're synchronously or asynchronously, should foster learning. They shouldn't be busy work where the kids are, are busy and have a lot of work to do, but their minds are completely turned off on the task because we know that that's not going to deliver the learning that we want students uh, to have in order to stay engaged. And we also know that when it comes to online learning, too often students feel as though they're being asked to just do a significant amount of rote learning with little rationale as to why that learning or why that activity is, is occurring. So we know that learning doesn't need to be a series of endless worksheets. So in order to make tasks more engaging and in order to deepen learning, we, we encourage the following four items please ensure that and encourage students to think in more than one way in order to transform from a closed task to an open task. Move from information um, to understanding by requiring students to connect and relate the information that they're learning. Ask students what they think first rather than telling students what to think. Uh, and encourage that understanding of what students might feel. And then position students in a path on a way forward to move from a procedure to more of a problem solving practice. And this, this picture that we show you here is Claudia Reed Wright. And what she does is she develops an at home learning men menu for her uh, online students. And what I really like about it is that it keeps the focus on the major functions of the learning, um, but gives children options and engaging tasks in order to solve problems, for them to ask questions, as well as draw on their creativity. And also notice the organization that is there. It's very clear for the child what's expected each day, and it's very clear for the parent or guardian that is supervising that child as far as what they are to do each day. 
And so we're going to take a minute and I'm going to provide you with a weekly planner for you to think through how would you organize it this way in one of your courses for an entire week of online learning. Please pause this video in order to complete that reflection. For this last section, let's talk about feedback, assessment, and grading. We know that feedback can be often one of the most underutilized instructional approaches, and yet it can be the most powerful for both students and teachers. And so when we look at formative feedback, we want to answer three questions for students. And you're going to see that these three questions relate back to the beginning of the video that we talked about. And the first question is, where am I going? Students wanna know where they're going as far as their instructional journey. The second question is, how am I going there? So they wanna know the how of the process in when it comes to the learning. And thirdly, they wanna know where will I go next? What are the next steps as far as their progress in their educational journey? And by providing answers to those three questions, it can be one of the most powerful processes in teaching and learning. Because we know that once the grade occurs, the, the learning stops because the students saw the grade and, and they're not going to continue to advance their learning and thinking on that particular project. So once the grade comes, the learning stops. And a second component that we wanna talk about is about designing our assessments, um, especially our, our final assessments for students. Often I've heard individuals say, oh, well, you know, when, when they were online, the kids, they, they cheated or all they did was cheat on the things that I gave them. Well, when we look at if a student can Google an answer to a, a question, then perhaps it's not necessarily the student's fault that they can Google it. It's, it's in, inherent in their nature and in their, their generational abilities to just Google an answer if it's Google a bull. And so with that being said, it's one of my, this is one of my favorite quotes because it's more about the design of our assessments than it is the fact that students were able to Google it. So the goal is not necessarily that students are able to regurgitate a simple fact. We want them to be able to take multiple facts and pull together either a project or they want to, you want them to be able to write a persuasive essay. You want them to be able to conduct a speech. Um, you want them to be able to run an experiment and complete an experimental evaluation report. The goal is the more comprehensive accumulation of those ideas. And so I want you to, as you're thinking through your online experiences and, and what you ask of children when it comes to assessment, feedback, and grading, is ensure that the items that you create are not items that we can just simply Google the answer to because that's not where the learning happens. And that's also not where the critical thinking occurs. So I encourage you to keep this quote in mind as you're designing your assessments for children. Thank you for going on this journey with me when it comes to developing an online pedagogy that differs from the face-to-face -face environment. I hope that I've inspired some of your thinking. I hope that I've helped encourage you to be reflective in how your practice is going to differ with the online experience versus a face-to-face -face experience. If you've really liked the resources in the distance learning playbook, um, please let me know. I'll be happy to get a copy of this for you. Also, all the resources are available online as far as the reflective pieces. But if you're interested, it's an excellent resource, especially if you do like uh, Hattie Fisher and Fry. Um, thank you again for your time and for your reflection. And here's to a great start to the school year.